This episode of The Cyberwire is made possible in part by SpyCloud. Stolen data circulating on the criminal underground is fuel for data breaches, account takeover, ransomware attacks, and online fraud. Your biggest security risk might be a breach or malware infection outside of your control that exposes the data of your users. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data sourced from the dark web that power solutions that proactively protect over 3 billion employees and consumer accounts worldwide. Learn how to make recaptured data your best defense at spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. Nuisance-level DDoS and cyber espionage continue to mark Russia's cyber campaign in the hybrid war. There's a U.S. presidential memorandum on software supply chain security. Webworm repurposes older rats. Trends in cyber insurance claims. Origin Logger may be the new agent Tesla. The sparkling goblin APT has been described. Matthew Gorge of Vigitrust describes cyber vulnerabilities in the hospitality industry. Dinah Davis from Arctic Wolf explains a PayPal phishing attack. And Royal Funeral Fish Bay. From the Cyberwire Studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your Cyberwire Summary for Thursday, September 15th, 2022. KillNet, the nominally hacktivist outfit that works for Russian intelligence services, counted coup against Japan recently, another country Moscow views as unfriendly. The group claimed last week to be responsible for distributed denial-of-service attacks against some Japanese government websites, Asia News Network reports. The attacks had only minor effects on their targets. This morning, researchers with Cisco's Talos Group reported that Gameradon, that is, Primitive Bear, has continued its efforts to compromise Ukrainian institutions in a long-running cyber espionage campaign. The technique is phishing, and the fish bait is news about the war. Talos says, We discovered Gameradon APT activity targeting users in Ukraine with malicious LNK files distributed in RAR archives. The campaign, part of an ongoing espionage operation observed as recently as August 2022, aims to deliver information-stealing malware to Ukrainian victim machines and makes heavy use of multiple modular PowerShell and VBScript scripts as part of the infection chain. The InfoStealer is a dual-purpose malware that includes capabilities for exfiltrating specific file types and deploying additional binary and script-based payloads on an infected endpoint. As sanctions continue to bite, there's a real possibility that Russian cyber operators will turn to industrial espionage, the record says, as they attempt to regain access to technology now denied them. In this, they would appear to be following the North Korean model, where making money for the state has long been a central goal of offensive cyber operations. Yesterday, the White House issued guidance for federal agencies' use of software security practices. The memorandum instructs agencies to obtain self-attestation from software providers that their products are in line with NIST's security guidelines. It's advisory and not strongly prescriptive, and some industry observers think it's a further step in presenting best practices. The Symantec Threat Hunter team has released a report detailing the activities of a group they're calling Webworm. Webworm uses three older remote-access Trojan rats, Trochilus, Ghost Rat, and 9002 Rat. Webworm is probably connected with the group identified as Space Pirates, perhaps even being the same group. The group has been active since 2017 and has been seen targeting government agencies as well as enterprises in industries such as IT services, aerospace, and electric power, specifically targeting Russia, Georgia, Mongolia, and other Asian countries. 
Symantec researchers identified an indicator of compromise from observing an operation targeting an IT provider that serves multiple Asian countries. Prior research had determined that the threat actor uses custom loaders hidden behind decoy documents and modified back doors that have been around for quite some time, which Symantec says is in line with what they've been seeing. The Trochilus rat is implemented in C++ and has been observed in use by hackers since 2015, with the source code available on GitHub. Symantec says that the capabilities of the Trojan include the ability to remotely uninstall a file manager and the ability to download, upload, and execute files, among other things. The 9002 RAT has been around since at least 2009, with state-sponsored threat actors often being users of the malware. The Trojan is used for data exfiltration and has been seen in use by multiple threat actors. The Ghost Rat's source code has been around since 2008 and has seen continued use by advanced persistent threat groups. Fill out your scorecards at home. Security and insurance firm Coalition has released a mid-year update to its 2022 cyber claims report and details what claims for cyber losses show with respect to the evolution of cyber trends. Small businesses were found to have become more attractive targets, with the average claim cost for a small business rising to $139,000 in the first half of 2022. This represents a 58% increase over claims for the first half of 2021. The number of ransomware attacks decreased, however, and the dollar amount demanded by ransomware threat actors has also decreased from $1.37 million in the second half of 2021 to $896,000 in the first half of 2022. Chris Hendricks, Coalition's head of incident response, said, Organizations are increasingly aware of the threat ransomware poses. They have started to implement controls, such as offline data backups, that allow them to refuse to pay the ransom and restore operations through other means. As ransomware is on the decline, attackers are turning to reliable methods. Phishing, for example, has skyrocketed and only continues to grow. Phishing attacks have accounted for just over half of reported claims, Coalition says, and they have been found to be the most common trigger for cybersecurity incidents. Palo Alto Networks Unit 42 has released a report detailing Origin Logger. On March 4, 2019, well-known keylogger agent Tesla shut down, but not without first recommending in its Discord server another keylogger known as Origin Logger, saying, If you want to see a powerful software like Agent Tesla, we would like to suggest Origin Logger. Origin Logger is an AT-based software and has all the features. Origin Logger is a variant of Agent Tesla, sometimes tagged as Agent Tesla version 3, which means that tools meant to detect Agent Tesla should also detect Origin Logger. Jeff White, writer of the report and a researcher at Unit 42, says the functionality of the malware is fairly standard and mirrors other Agent Tesla variants. White said, Just as the threat actor's advertisements state, the malware uses tried-and-true methods and includes the ability to keylog, steal credentials, take screenshots, download additional payloads, upload your data in a myriad of ways, and attempt to avoid detection. Commercial keyloggers have historically catered to less advanced attackers, but as illustrated in the initial lure document analyzed here, this does not make attackers any less capable of using multiple hooks and services to obfuscate and make analysis more complicated. Commercial keyloggers should be treated with equal amounts of caution, as would be used with any malware. Researchers at ESET warn that the Chinese APT Sparkling Goblin is using a new Linux variant of its sidewalk malware. ESET states, This variant was deployed against a Hong Kong university in February 2021, the same university that had already been targeted by Sparkling Goblin during the student protests in May 2020. We originally named this backdoor Stage Client, but now refer to it simply as Sidewalk Linux. We also discovered that a previously known Linux backdoor, the Spectre Rat, first documented by 360 NetLab, is also actually a Sidewalk Linux variant, having multiple commonalities with the samples we identified. 
The researchers add that the Linux variant of the malware isn't as evasive as its Windows counterparts, stating, The Windows variant of Sidewalk goes to great lengths to conceal the objectives of its code. It trimmed out all data and code that was unnecessary for its execution and encrypted the rest. On the other hand, the Linux variants contain symbols and leave some unique authentication keys and other artifacts unencrypted, which makes the detection and analysis significantly easier. The name Sparkling Goblin sounds pretty festive, but still, it's bad mojo. As is usually the case with any high-profile event that touches many people, the funeral of Queen Elizabeth II has been exploited by criminals who are using it for fish bait. In a tweeted series of posts, Proofpoint describes a credential phishing campaign in which messages that misrepresent themselves as coming from Microsoft invite recipients to visit an artificial technology hub established in Her Majesty's honor. The URL redirects to a credential harvesting site. The threat actors are using the evil proxy phishing kit. Not to be outdone by the Senate Judiciary Committee having heard from Mudge, the Senate Homeland Security Committee has heard from a range of present and former executives at Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, and other social media platforms. We're watching to see how things develop, but in the meantime, did we say yesterday by mistake that Senator Klobuchar was from Michigan? We think we may have, and we blame the editors. An alert listener from the land of 10,000 lakes, the North Star State of Minnesota, pointed out that we'd slipped, and of course that's right. Senator Klobuchar represents the sovereign state of Minnesota, and our apologies to her and the entire gopher state. We blame, as I said, editorial carelessness. Our political desk is fine with states whose names begin with M.A., like Maine and Maryland, but they get hazy when they leave the eastern seaboard for the M.I. states like Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, Mississippi. Too many garden staters on that desk. Forget about it. Coming up after the break, Mathieu Gorge of Vigitrust describes cyber vulnerabilities in the hospitality industry. Dinah Davis from Arctic Wolf explains a PayPal phishing attack. Stick around. And now, a word from our sponsor, Dragos. Asset visibility is the foundation of an effective operational technology cybersecurity strategy. Many core cybersecurity program pillars depend on having rich and complete asset visibility with intelligence-driven context. Dragos has a white paper which provides 10 distinct ways that asset visibility helps inform a broader strategy for OT visibility, including discovering, classifying, and verifying ICS and OT assets, network connectivity and communication signaling potential threats, providing key information for incident response, minimizing the impact of compliance reporting, and justifying security investments and roadmap planning. To download, go to dragos.com slash 10 dash ways. That's dragos.com slash the number 10 dash ways. And we thank Dragos for sponsoring our show. And now a word from our sponsor, Axonius. Too many cybersecurity assets and SaaS apps, not enough visibility. Enter Axonius. The Axonius solution correlates asset data from existing solutions to provide an always up-to-date inventory, uncover gaps, and automate action, giving IT and security teams the confidence to control complexity. Visit axonius.com slash cyberwire to learn more and try it free. That's A-X-O-N-I-U-S dot com slash cyberwire. And we thank Axonius for sponsoring our show. The hospitality industry seems to have a target on its back lately, with news stories of hotel chains and resorts falling victim to a variety of cyber attacks and data breaches. Matthew Gorge is founder and CEO of Vigitrust, an integrated risk management SaaS provider. 
I reached out to him for insights on the particular challenges organizations in the hospitality sector face. Hotel chains obviously have employees, so they've got employee data, they've got trade secrets and, and so on. They've got banking information for their suppliers, they've got list of suppliers. From a consumer perspective, when you go into a hotel, you can expect to provide some sort of ID, so PII, a uh, credit card, so credit card holder data. And let's say that you're going to use the spa or you're going to use any type of other service, you may even provide some protected health information. So part of the, the, the major challenge for the hospitality industry is that some of the services within a hotel may actually be subcontracted to someone else. For instance, the spa could be operated by a third party. Some of the restaurants might be uh, operated by a third party. The gym might be operated by a third party and so on. But from a, a user perspective, what you want to be able to do is you want to be given one card or one app that allows you to roam about within the property and use all of the different, the different services. And so therein lies the, the, the challenge from a data perspective. All of those systems need to be interconnected. And so they are interdependent and become each other's weak, weak points in terms of security. So you need to secure the overall chain and the overall ecosystem and chain of custody. The second challenge for the, the hospitality industry is that most large hotel chains operate on a mixed model where they have properties that they own and manage, property that they don't own but manage, and also properties that might be franchised out. And then the third challenge uh, is that there are some uh, franchise operators that will operate brand A, brand B, and brand C in order to have a mix of properties within a certain region. So they end up having to deal with loads of different systems, dealing with, with the data, but if, at the end of the day, they're responsible for the overall data. You know, I, I know you and your colleagues there at Vigitrust uh, do a, a good amount of work within the hospitality sector. What are the differences that you see between the hotel chains that are successful here, and but then at the other end of the spectrum, we have some chains, even big ones, well-known ones, and we keep seeing their names pop up over and over again as having been breached. The One of the characteristics of the, the, the property market within the, the hospitality industry is that there's a lot of buying and selling. So you might have a chain that one day will belong to Hilton, one day will belong to Accor, and then will move to Marriott, for instance. So they keep buying stuff of each other, um, depending on their regional strategies and, and, and other criteria that they may have. Um, the problem comes within the integration of what they buy and what they sell into, into the overall security strategy because the systems, particularly the, the main system, the PMS might be different. The payment uh, terminals might be di different. Um, and the overall security strategy might be different from one brand to the other. So what you want to do is you want a strategy that protects the the data at global level, at regional hub level, and then within each property. And, and, and so the, the most successful chains um, are extremely careful when they, uh, when they sell uh, in, in a, a chain of hotel or a group of hotels because what, what they do is we make sure that no residual data can come back to hit them afterwards. And they're even more careful when they integrate new properties with new systems. Um, and those integrations, you have to remember, could, could take months, maybe a couple of years. And it's, it, there's been issues in the industry where a large chain bought uh, a, a big group of hotels from another one, and there was a, a breach within that time frame. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and, and that, that can happen, you know. I, I think that the, the solution or the, the, the best practice for uh, chains of hotels or for franchisors that have multiple properties across one brand or several brands is to really start by mapping the ecosystem and looking at the low-hanging fruit. Uh, the low-hanging fruit in the hotel industry, in my humble opinion, is that you can use PCI DSS as the minimum standard of security you need to have in your properties. And that gives you your very minimum benchmark. And none of it is unachievable. It's all within 
the realms of of reality for any company. And so, um, the 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 other quick win is security awareness training. Security mm. awareness training is mandated by uh, GDPR, by CCPA, by PCI, indeed, for anybody that has access to 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 sensitive data. And then, you based on that, you can create a very effective program that allows you to um, to essentially fight against uh, social engineering attacks, phishing attacks, and all of those low-level attacks that unfortunately end up being the root cause of most of those breaches within the, the, the retail and the hospitality industry. That's Matthew Gorge from Vigitrust. And I am pleased to welcome back to the show Dinah Davis. She is the VP of R&D Operations at Arctic Wolf, and she is also the founder of Code Like a Girl. Dinah, great to have you back. Um, You saw some interesting phishing attacks, uh, mention of such, that seem to be targeting PayPal here. Unpack what's going on here for us. Yeah, this one was so interesting to me. It's a it's I found it on a Twitter thread and it's about a phishing email with PayPal and the user is OXDF. I tried to figure out what that meant. Like I tried to do some like, you know, figure out with hackers like, and, and right, stuff. Right, speak and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. and I, did, I don't know. Um, <laughs> okay. but, but the person runs a blog called The Hack Box. They're quite prolific on uh, GitHub. They have a whole profile there. Uh, so they seem to be like potentially a legit researcher. In any case, this is interesting and it looks like it could really happen. So they got an email that appeared to be from PayPal and I have PayPal. I They've got screenshots in this Twitter thread. It all looks pretty legit to me. It's, it's from the PayPal domain. The email claimed to be an invoice update. Um, and they're asking the user to pay $1,000 US to the billing department of PayPal. So specifically, it says invoice updated. Billing department of PayPal updated your invoice. Amount to do $1,000. View and pay invoice. Hmm. So, wow. Okay. And then there's like a note from the billing department there where you can call. And there's urgency to this because it says you need to log into PayPal within 24 hours to avoid getting charged. So you have to like Hmm. click the link or the number and, and do it right away. And so, you know... The interesting part is when you click the link, you're taken to a legit PayPal site. So hmm. that that doesn't even compute. It's like, what? how did this happen? Like, what is going on here? Right. Well, what's going on is another PayPal user is asking them to pay $1,000, and they happen to manage to get the username Billing Department of PayPal. Right. Okay. Yeah. I'm just right? you're 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 hearing me react to this in real time in both horror and uh, admiration for the, the cleverness. But <laughs> that's what I'm saying. <laughs> this is pretty clever. Yeah. Um, and so you know, yeah. So you you actually do get paid. Sorry, you actually do get taken to a legit PayPal site. And, you know, at the top on the right-hand side is the pay $1,000. Now, if you scroll down a bit, it says it has an itemized list of what the items are, and the item is a Walmart e-gift card. And that yeah. should be where your flag goes, what? Right, right. <laughs> like, this, why am I paying somebody $1,000? Like, why am I paying the, the PayPal billing department for uh, a, a $1,000 Walmart e-gift card, right? So, mm-hmm. so okay, there mm-hmm. is a tell here. There is a tell, right? The other thing is, you know, they were able to get that. Now, my guess is that that, one, that particular user has been shut down now. And yeah. hopefully maybe PayPal goes and looks at the usernames people are picking, and that's going to be a bit better. But what's what's the lesson here, right? So don't pay for anything on PayPal unless you know it's a legit transaction. Anybody can send you an invoice. It doesn't even need to be like this fake kind of user. Anybody can send you a, an invoice on PayPal. They just need your email address, right? Right. 
So always double check what what it's coming in for. Like even yesterday, before I read this, I, I had one that was like, Apple is is uh, charging you uh, $16. I'm like, for what? I don't remember paying anything. Mm. Um, and, you know, I had to go through my old emails, find the receipt. Oh, I paid, paid for Duolingo in Spanish for my daughter. Okay, mm-hmm. so fine, good. And then I, I, I could know that that was all right and that the transaction was fine. But, but you got to do that research, right? Don't click on links in emails ever. Don't call the phone <laughs> numbers you get in the emails ever. And when I went to go and check about my Apple receipt, I went to my Apple account and I went to my PayPal directly. I didn't click any of the links in, in any of the emails. I went and logged in myself and double checked that things were there. Another interesting thing. So to do that, maybe you would have typed in, you know, you see this come in, you're like, oh, I want to go to my PayPal page. Um, and you type in PayPal in Google. Maybe you don't remember the whole URL and the, it pulls up the responses. Do not click on the first Google searches that are ads. Mm. Ever for anything, um, because there's a lot of phishing that is happening just on those searches with the Google ads. So somebody can create a fake PayPal site, and maybe the L is actually a one, and they can pay for ads that pop it up to the top of the search results. And when you click on it, it looks like you're going there. It feels like you searched it and did the right thing. Uh, but right. you've now logged in someplace wrong. So I never, ever, ever click the ads for anything. I always go down below the ads, scroll past them, and then hit the 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 first real link that, that is yeah. there. So that's another little tidbit around this. Yeah. Do you suppose the folks who are behind uh, this particular phishing attack that they're just looking for the inattentiveness of, of a, you know, an accounting department or something like that? A hundred percent. That That's totally true. And it, these are really easy to create in PayPal because you just create an invoice like you, you, have, you need a business account to be able to pull this off. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know how, what the hoops are that you have to go through to get a business account. Maybe those need to be checked by PayPal a little bit more closely. Um, but yeah, it, it's just creating an invoice and being able to, to do something like this. All right. Well, fascinating. Absolutely. Diana Davis, thanks for joining us. This episode of The Cyberwire is made possible in part by CrowdSec, CrowdSec helps rebalance the asymmetrical cybersecurity industry by making their open-source multiplayer firewall available to all for free. Once threats are identified, all users are notified to ensure everyone's protection. No matter what your business size, CrowdSec offers adaptive response to credential stuffing, port scans, password brute forcing, and much more. At CrowdSec, they have each other's backs and make the internet safer together. Visit crowdsec.net to learn more. And that's the Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. The Cyberwire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing Cyberwire team is Elliot Peltzman, Trey Hester, Brandon Karp, Eliana White, Bru Prakash, Liz Irvin, Rachel Gelfand, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. And now, a word from our sponsor, Alert Logic. 
The defining characteristic of a managed detection and response service is its focus on delivering a meaningful security outcome, meant to ease both pre-breach and post-breach concerns. Maximum visibility and the ability to detect and respond to threats combines with capabilities to minimize the impact of vulnerabilities, configuration issues, and attacks. An effective MDR solution must address both. Alert Logic is the only MDR provider that delivers comprehensive coverage for public clouds, SaaS, on premises, and hybrid environments. Their cloud native technology and white glove team of security experts protect your organization 24 7 and ensure you have the most effective response to resolve whatever threats may come. Alert Logic is the industry's first SaaS MDR provider with purpose built technology and security experts that help identify and respond to cybersecurity breaches, providing complete compliance solutions that give customers peace of mind and deliver on best practices. Learn more about how Alert Logic's MDR can provide complete coverage for your most critical assets at alertlogic.com. That's alertlogic.com. And we thank Alert Logic for sponsoring our show. 